you've had a lunch, and as I, if you're anything like me after lunch, things get sleepy. So um, I'd like everyone to stand up. Can we have the lights in the room, please? And stretch. Stretch. Get all that energy out. And then I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and share with each other for the next two or three minutes one thing that you have taken away or learned from the CSV forum today so far. Just share with, with each other. Then. Standing up. Now you can grab your seats again. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. Okay. Now we'll continue and hopefully you're more awake for the rest of the afternoon. Um, we're now going to go into our third panel discussion which is on increasing the resilience of farmers. If you recall that uh, the last discussion was about defining innovative approaches to inclusive and sustainable growth. So I'd like to invite our panelists on the th onto stage. First, Rob Cameron, who's the Executive Director of Sustainability on stage. He's gonna be moderating this session. And then we have Robert L. Thompson, Professor Mandy Rukuni. Where is Mandy Rukuni? And then uh, Masanje Ture Litze, William Marshall. Yes, Mandy was here a moment ago. I don't know where he went. Well, Rob, over to you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, is this microphone now working? Yep. Is this working? No, it's not. Okay, I'll sit down and use this one, and we'll wait to see if this one will come on. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, good afternoon, everybody. That's better. Now we can be heard. So, ah, you're going to... Ah, okay, perfect. Even better. Things are looking up. Uh, excellent. Well, you know, I was talking to the fellow panelists yesterday, and I said I thought this should be the most inspirational uh, moment of the day, and I'm sorry to have to disappoint you, because I think you'll all agree that what we just saw was just about the most uh, fantastic of uh, sessions uh, to hear the farmer's voice presented in that way. And uh, just one more time, can we just show some appreciation for both of the finalists? Now, we're, we're having a panel this afternoon. Uh, we're going to need one more chair, actually. If, Mandy, where were you? We were, I'll grab, I'll grab let's, chair. Okay. Just grab a chair from somewhere. That'd be great. So with us on the panel uh, this afternoon, um, we have a, a super panel, uh, an ever-growing panel, in fact. On the far side, we have Professor Bob Thompson. Bob is the Professor Emeritus in Agricultural Economy at the University of Illinois. Uh, coming up alongside, we have uh, Professor Mandivamba Rukuni. Uh, with no shortage of professors on this panel. Um, now, Mandivamba Rukuni is professor uh, at the uh, Bulawayo State University for Science and Technology, but is also a professor extraordinaire of his BEAT Academy, the Barefoot Education Africa Trust. In the middle there, we have, I'm delighted to have on the stage, uh, Sophie Siraka. Uh, Sophie is a farmer, uh, or at least she manages a co-op, and we'll say a few more words about Sophie in a moment, but uh, suffice it to, uh, to say that in the space of 10 years, this is a young woman who has gone from having no experience in running an organization, still less running a cooperative, to running a cocoa farm that has 500 members and some of the most advanced work that's happening today in Cote d'Ivoire when it comes to gender empowerment and quality improvement. So we're thrilled to have you with us, Sophie. Alongside Sophie, we have Madame Masanje Turelitze. Uh, Masanje is the Director General 
of the cacao, uh, uh, the Conseil du, Caf Ca Conseil du Café et Cacao, <laughs> the Coffee and Cocoa Council here in Côte d'Ivoire. And then finally, alongside me here, we have William Warsaw. Uh, Will is the president and chief executive of TechnoServe, which many of you will know is one of the most impactful organizations working in the field. So we've got a super panel for you. Um, we also have you all in the room, and I know from the conversations that I've been having uh, in the last 24 hours just how much expertise there is in the room. So we'll be looking for your comments and questions, and we have a couple of people who I know are prepared already to say a few words. We're also very aware that this is a global forum. As a global forum, we have an online audience, and they're very welcome, and we're looking forward to seeing some comments and particularly some questions coming through on the Twitter feed so that we can get a vibrant discussion going, not just in this room, but across the world. But when it comes to pharma resilience, I don't think we can really have that discussion without first hearing the voice of the pharma. So we have a short film that just brings to life some of the challenges that farmers here in Africa are facing. Let's run the video. Video. Matata ar kopana lona mo khopare thupeng ya gore ke a antseng yana re phela ka rapita ha re na machinery gore re ka kwa kilimo kwa kweli ukanda wa chini tractor tunapata lakini ni kwa bei na hapa kupata shamba ni gumu mtu akiwa na eka nyingi ni eka tatu sasa ukisema kwamba ni unataka labda uwe na unataka kulima mahindi eka 10 utapata we have a a type of animal in the forest called a cotti grass, which is very destructive, so it helps to reduce our produce. Dawa iko nju, saidi. Kama saidi nimesha uza maingi yangu kwa sabu ya ya kuingilio na wadudu. La difficulty que je rencontre encore, c'est le moyen de transport. Because during rainy days, the way our farm is situated, it's not easy for us to to reach there. Kama tu zamu angu kijana kama kijana kulima. Anaona ni shuli ambaye hawezi kumpatia kipato. Wale ambao wamebahatika kwenda kwenye elimu ya juu tena hawarudi huko wanapishia huko huko na akipata nafasi anajua kule hakuna cha kufuata. And then butata bona le mbona hapo bobo to na ke natural disaster. Mvua zinaweza zikanyesha ukifikiri ni mvua zinaendelea zinakatika. We experienced that year when the rain it came earlier than anticipated. Ikibika, ikibika wakati waku, wakulima waribu. Wanaribu wa siringi tato, siringi tano. Hapa ndipo hiyo ndiyo kile metiri atari. Thank you. So those are some of the issues that farmers are facing here and now. Uh, but, but this is Nestle's CSV Global Forum. So before we get into the specifics of Côte d'Ivoire, I wanted to turn to you, Bob, somewhat, let me think, it would be six years ago now, in 2010, you wrote one of the hardest hitting pieces I have read in a Nestle CSV report that looked at the global context of food production and agriculture, the challenges that we were facing globally. Well, we're six years on. I just wondered if you'd like to start with a, a global reflection on the state of the ledger and how that ledger relates to some of the challenges that we've just seen on the ground. Let me just touch your microphone, press the button on the front, that would do it. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to have a chance to uh, uh, revisit the uh, uh, report that I wrote for Nestle six years ago. Uh, 
in the context of the uh, C CSV report uh, that emphasized rural development to the contributions, Nestle's uh, investments in food processing facilities in rural areas of develop developing countries plays in uh, f facilitating rural development. But we addressed the two great challenges of rural development. The first was basically how are we going to feed the world's larger population better than today at reasonable cost without destroying the environment. And the second and parallel uh, issue was uh, poverty in rural areas. We knew that 70% of the extreme poverty is in rural areas, yet there was a pronounced urban bias in the allocation of national investment uh, for development as well as World Bank lending and foreign aid. Uh, so there was a great concern about what do we do need to be doing to reduce rural poverty. And, uh, and, th and thirdly, agriculture had fallen off the international development agenda uh, back in the mid-1980s. Uh, resources being invested in agriculture and rural development had fallen precipitously over a period of, of 20 years. So uh, we looked first at the, uh, at the projected demand for food in the world. Uh, we, saw, we observed that with the population growth, the broad-based economic growth, the record rates of poverty reduction, particularly in Asia, as well as the urbanization that was permitting people to, uh, uh, to well, introducing people to new foods that, uh, so they diversify their diet as they move to cities. We saw that uh, demand for food was likely to grow close by a factor of two uh, in the first half of the 21st century, or that would be about two thirds from now till 2050. But then here's the crunch. There's at most 10% more land on which to produce close to twice as much food. And probably with the rapid rate of urbanization that's going on, cities are outbidding farmers for available fresh water. Farmers have been using 70% of the fresh water in the world, but now the urban population by mid-century is projected to go to 70%. And if 70% of the world's people are living in cities mid-century, the world's farmers will not have access to 70% of the fresh water. So this means that if we're going to double production on at most 10% more land using less total water than today, uh, we've got a real challenge in raising productivity of both the land that we use in agriculture, but also the water we use in agriculture. And then we overlay this challenge with the reality of climate change, the, particularly the effect of the increasing frequency of extreme climatic events, uh, extreme droughts, extreme flooding, extreme tornadic activity, uh, that uh, we're increasing the risk in the already risky business of farming. You know, farmer's income is the product of two random variables, price times quantity. When the farmer makes the planning decision, knows at best in a probability sense what the price is going to be at harvest, and uh, with the dependence of yields on weather conditions, uh, the farmer knows at best in a probability sense what the yield per hectare will be. So. Revenue is highly volatile, unpredictable, and with low-income farmers living close to the margin of subsistence, uh, that means uh, that the risk of uh, falling into uh, a desperate situation uh, is, is very, very great. Now, turning quickly to Africa, uh, drawing the implication for today, Africa, of course, is the one continent in the world that's projected to more than double its population in the next 35 years. In fact, the current projection is a 120% increase in the population of sub-Saharan Africa. And when you overlay that with the rapid rate of urbanization, uh, as well as the uh, broadening base of uh, economic growth in more and more countries, we're finding uh, the demand for food in Africa literally exploding. Now, as we heard this morning, Africa imports, uh, what, $35 billion worth of food? Uh, each year, and there's simply no excuse for Africa to not be self-sufficient in food today. Uh, productivity levels are less than half the world average in many crops, uh, actually less than a quarter of the world average in many crops. So there's great potential for adopting already available technologies to raise that productivity, and we need the productivity both for African farmers to contribute more to the national and continental food supply, but also to increasing income of the lowest income members of society. 
when we re remind that 70% of the extreme poverty is in rural areas, most of them are farmers, uh, we desperately need to raise productivity in agriculture, but also create other opportunities to generate greater income in, in rural areas. But there's no reason for Africa not to achieve this, uh, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about more this afternoon. Indeed we will. Thanks, Bob. That's really helpful. Um, I just want to follow up, though, on one thing. Uh, we've got a title for our panel, uh, in Improving Farmer Resilience. And, you know, it, it seems to me that this term, farmer resilience, is one of those terms that we kind of all think we know what we mean by it, but actually, what does it really mean? What, when, you, when you think of the term resilience, what specifically comes to mind for you, and how would you know it if you saw it? Well, to me, I think the most important aspect of resilience is the uh, ability to recover from severe shocks. And right. as I pointed out, that uh, the farm revenue is the product of two random variables, neither of which the farmer controls. Right. Uh, and uh, if you're living at close to the margin of subsistence, uh, you can devastate you, all your savings if, if you have a couple bad years in a row. Mm. So resilience really involves, I believe, the ability to recover from, from a severe shock. Right. Good. Helpful. So that's the, that's the definition that we're working with. If anybody wants to, later on in the afternoon, uh, give us an alternative slant on how you would spot resilience when you see it, then we'll be, uh, we'll be glad to, to have that discussion. Great. So we've had this global perspective. I have to say it's a challenging message that you've laid out for us. Uh, but you also make the point that there's no reason why Africa could not be self-sufficient in food. So, Mandy, let me come to you. You've, you've been looking at this Thank you. through the lens of community, and in your book, uh, Being African, you, you urged that, as well lo as looking at all of the innovations and the technologies, maybe it's time to look a little bit more deeply at community. Just expand a little bit on your theme of community and how it applies to farmers and resilience, please. Oh, okay. uh, thanks, Rob. I think my main message on this issue of resilience is that, um, well, for, e for economic assets to perform, we need social assets that also perform. You can't have economic development without social infrastructure. And res resilience, uh, just to add on to uh, Bob's definition, is therefore the capacity not only at community level but at national level to bounce back. And in that regard, resilience is therefore a fairly dynamic capacity. It's capacity to deal with challenges today as well as opportunities and, 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 and capacity to deal with challenges tomorrow. So, so it's no good just being capable of dealing with challenges today. We want our communities to be able to deal with both challenges and opportunities tomorrow. I also believe that the literature on resilience is too heavy on the negative side of things. We always see new challenges as an obstacle to civilization. In actual fact, there would not be life at all if there were no continuous challenges that come our way as, as human beings. So I, I think Kofi Annan put it very well this morning when he said, and I'll try to paraphrase, I think he said something to the effect, businesses cannot succeed where society is failing. Something to that effect. In other words, investors go to those places where they believe that there is some resilience of some kind. The only thing is that with big corporates, they can get refuge from governments. Sometimes governments can, can put in place mechanisms to mitigate against risks for big corporates. But for smallholder farmers, who are the main people we are talking about in terms of resilience, they, they need local institutions that perform. They cannot always rely on government, which is very far away somewhere. So let's start with what we have. And what we have are millions of these smallholder farmers, who are, by the way, supplying anything up to 90% of all food that is consumed in our rural towns and cities. And these cities are growing very fast. So behind the smallholder farmers are these uh, small-scale intermediary groups, the transporters, the warehouses, the people who are moving cash back and forth, uh, lending each other money. There, there are many, many businesses that 
that, that are coming up. And I think there's two uh, winners today are a good indication uh, that the future, the immediate future of Africa in terms of agriculture and agribusiness and food systems is in those small, medium-sized businesses. So we're talking about resilience so that they can actually move faster. Now, I'd like to start with uh, a characterization which I don't know whether you'll agree with me, Bob, because I think the single most important defining factor on Africa, especially its uh, progress, is the difference between Africa and the rest of the world in terms of the structural transformation process. Because we've seen that the US, Europe, and now the industrializing part of Asia, people are moving in urban areas because of manufacturing jobs. Africa is the only continent in the world where people are moving to urban areas en masse with no manufacturing jobs in the cities. They are going there for services, better schools, better access to this, that, and the other. So it then becomes important to realize that agriculture primarily is therefore the only means we really have initially to push uh, for economic growth in the rural areas where most people still are. But also, rural industrialization may be the conduit to long-term social and economic transformation. So on the basis of that, these, these uh, small businesses that are going up and down the Afri African continent, trying to get those markets in, this, in the growing urban areas, the rural cities, they are chasing that cash. So it's no longer appropriate to say it's the informal sector, because that's the term that governments and, and, and multilateral agencies have been using for a long time. It's not informal sector anymore. It's actually indigenous commerce. This is the real private sector that we have on the continent. So at early stages of structural transformation, social capital and, and, and economic capital is very close to each other, meaning social entrepreneurship is the conduit to economic entrepreneurship and vice versa. It is the same institutions at community level that are going to make a difference, both social and economic. For instance, we have waves of uh, 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 local institutions, be they uh, savings clubs, uh, burial societies, we have we have uh, innovation platforms to try and move businesses. We have cooperative movements. It's, they deal with both social and economic issues. So social entrepreneurship and business entrepreneurship is pretty much the same thing. So on that basis, it becomes important for governments uh, and, and, and corporates to basically realize that the weakest link in Africa and I, I mean, I, I, don't, I have not had many people argue this one, but I'm prepared to argue uh, that the weakest link in Africa are the weak local institutions. I, I, I've been to all over Europe, US, Asia. You go to China, India, local institutions are strong. But there's a paradox in Africa in that, although we Africans basically invented social institutions. Uh, this is where the family system started, strong community systems. This is where we're able, without a government, to resolve major issues. Today, these traditional institutions are decaying, and yet the governmental systems, including local government, are not performing. So our local uh, community institutions are falling through the cracks. And it becomes important for uh, corporate uh, or creating social value uh, uh, as a concept uh, uh, to, to, I know already it's embracing this, but I think for Africa it's even more important to realize that uh, we, we, we actually have to invest in creating stronger uh, social assets. I can sum it up in conclusion by saying basically the difference between Africa and Asia and other parts of the world is that we don't, as Africans, we've stopped believing in our own traditional institutions uh, and believe that we have to create new ones and replace them. I think the rest of the world, what they've done is they modernized their traditional institutions, modernized them into modern performing institutions. Uh, we tend to throw ours out with baby with the bath water. 
because we confuse uh, uh, modernization with westernization. We don't have to westernize to modernize. Yeah. We, can, we can borrow intelligently from the rest of the world, but we still have to Africanize these institutions so that they work best for our smallholder farmers and communities. Thank you. You have so eloquently put the issue of farmers and improving agricultural uh, capacity in a social context, and I think that's so important that we don't just think of these things in isolation. Thank you so much for that. Thinking about the community context uh, and bringing it into the Ivorian uh, situation, uh, we've also heard it said already in this panel that it's really important that we don't just concentrate on the negative, we find the positives. And there's a long way to go in the Ivorian cocoa sector, but anybody that's looked at it over the last five years would say that there's been some super improvements. And Masanja, I wonder if you could just reflect a little bit on how the Ivorian cocoa sector has developed, what its successes are, and what the basis of those successes ha have been. Thank you very much. Um, I will have to make my presentation in French, as I told you. Donc, je voudrais remercier Nestlé qui nous donne l'opportunité de opportunity to quickly present the encouraging results of the cocoa coffee sector over the past few years. I would like to recall that the reform of the sector was finalized in 2011 and it was uh, birthed in the political will to end the vulnerability and fragility of producers. A few objectives of the reform were to enhance good governance and transparency in the management of the sector's resources, and we wanted to develop cocoa coffee economy, a sustainable coffee and cocoa economy through improved productivity and uh, the fight against child labor. We also wanted to secure income to farmers with a minimum guaranteed price and also to improve the domestic and foreign trade. And we wanted to build strong and reliable farmers associations. So what can we retain as achievements today? We can talk about the stabilization of the price to the farmers. The farmers only received a tiny portion of the price in the past. That has changed and now they're getting 60% of the global price. And uh, the global prices have increased by 38%. And uh, the prices to farmers followed suit. Before the reform, we had the decrease in the production of coffee, but with the good prices, we've seen a uh, recovery in the coffee sector. We, all, we even have a recovery program for coffee. We've also worked on the improvement of the farm's um, yield. In conjunction with our Agricultural Research Center, we distribute 40,000 hectares of improved seed to improve, such as Nestle does, the productivity and the yields of farmers. And with our National Agricultural Promotion Agency, ANADER, we train farmers and we provide uh, input against soil and shoot, which is uh, a disease affecting uh, cocoa farms. There's something we want to share with 
you as well, which is important to us, is that's the improvement of the li living conditions of farmers. Our coffee and cocoa board has set up a rural development fund intervening in the areas of uh, health and education. So for four years now, we've been building 72 classrooms. We have 80 uh, housing for teachers. We have school feeding uh, programs with school canteens. And we have also distributed over 4,000 uh, student desks to schools. The Coffee and Cocoa Board also contributes uh, to the improvement of roads, rural dust roads. You all understand the interest because we have uh, to make the crops accessible and carry them to the ports. We also talked about water the board has uh, intervened in that area with drilling projects. We've also worked uh, on power projects, electrifying villages, and we also work on solar panels. One of our achievements, which even earned us uh, congratulations and uh, an ICCO prize, is the public-private partnership we developed uh, because we understand the challenges of the sector cannot only be addressed by the government of Cote d'Ivoire alone, but rather by all stakeholders in the chain. So we have people from the private sectors and technical and financial partners uh, gathered uh, around the platform and mobilized uh, several billion uh, CFA francs and sign in agreements to access input, promote agriculture and coffee recovery, improving the living conditions in, of uh, farmers and uh, fighting against the worst forms of uh, child labor. So this is what I wanted to share with you, even before I talk about the challenges. But we are more and more aware that we need to empower women. So the Coffee Cocoa Board supported the organization of a national f federation of uh, women producers of cocoa and coffee. And there's... Uh, fund to be set up to help those women with income generating activities. And we also have a youth program because everyone is speaking about the aging of producers and farms as well. So to pass on the baton, we have a youth program to encourage the youth to grow cocoa and coffee. Regarding climate change challenges, uh, the Prime Minister spoke about that this morning. Uh, the Cocoa and Coffee Board initiated the uh, forest-friendly cocoa uh, production to help uh, with the fight against deforest deforestation. A, a, a reflection um, on what you say. Uh, firstly, this morning we heard Mr. Volker say that government sets the frame, business operates within it, and you've just described a perfect case study of exactly that in action, which is great to hear. We also heard this morning the importance of making farming cool for the youth. Now, I don't know if cocoa farming is cool right now, but certainly you're doing what you, you, you can do. There's one thing I did want to come back on, though. Um, uh, the last comment in the film referenced climate change, but that the worst form of climate change was fluctuating financial climates, in other words, price fluctuations. How are you, what can you do 
in the council to try and help farmers withstand the shocks of wildly fluctuating commodity prices. Bien, merci. Déjà, je pense que la réforme de la du the reform of the sector by stabilizing prices according to the uh, sale uh, uh, allows us uh, to uh, resolve the issue of uh, price fluctuation and therefore we can uh, get the prices and we can propose 60 percent of those prices to the farmers. It is important to know that the price of chocolate, because we were told that uh, producers only pro pro receive 6 percent of uh, chocolate products. But in uh, 1980, it was 16 percent of these products that were received by the producers. So. There is a, an issue to be resolved, and that is why in our PPPs uh, there is a working group that is uh, examining this issue of the price of cocoa and the revenue or the income of the producers. In the meantime, what we are doing is that we are asking the producers to diversify their products and not be uh, prisoners of only one product. And so there is a diversification in uh, uh, growing cocoa, cocoa uh, coffee, and uh, foodstuff. And that opens up uh, possibilities, I guess, for uh, investment along the lines that you described, Mandy, in terms of building community structures, but also those community structures having the opportunity to to build other forms of uh, income generation, whether it's crop diversification or whether it's non-farm jobs and potentially uh, you know, capturing some of the first stage processing, which can also be a part of building resilient communities. Sophie, I want to come to you now, if I could. I said a little bit earlier on about the uh, extraordinary success of ECAB, but I can only imagine that whilst you have a successful cooperative now, there's been many struggles. You've got a fair trade certified, UTS certified, participant in the COCO plan. But just tell us a little bit about your story and the challenges you faced and how you've met them, please. Okay. Thank you. I would first like to thank Nestle for having associated me to this conference so I can talk about what uh, we are experiencing because we are producers and therefore we can be witnesses of everything that is happening. So in the first, so first I would like to draw everybody's attention to the importance of a cooperative because uh, if you take the farmer individually, uh, he or she may not be listened to. So you need to bring them together around a professional organization and in the rural world uh, this kind of uh, cooperation can be organized and this is what we've done. We've uh, identified producers, uh, we've uh, assessed their needs and one of the objectives of the cooperative is to help these members and therefore you have to give first, and in return, you will get the results that you're looking for. And so that's how we brought them together. And thanks to God, uh, with the help of OADA, which is a reference in terms of organization, this cooperative was turned into a real company. And from there, since we uh, thinking of ourselves as a company now, we had to strengthen, uh, to build our capacities uh, in terms of the organization and in terms of the producers themselves. So when we talk about resilience, it is a conducive environment that uh, we've uh, put in place in order to have a 
strong uh, agriculture, a strong farm, and strong producers. Uh, Madame was talking about uh, the swollen shoot uh, in uh, the region of the Marawe. Uh, this uh, swollen shoot uh, is um, very prevalent and uh, is causing a lot of uh, uh, difficulties. And we had to renew all the cocoa farms uh, because you can't talk of producers if there are no farms. So in the first place, with the uh, opportunity we were given by the cocoa and coffee board with the uh, new plants, uh, we received more than 40 hectares of these plants, uh, and uh, we, decided, we decided to renew all these farms. Uh, Next to the disease, you also have to look at uh, the uh, age of the farms uh, or, or the plants. And uh, we've decided to work on that as well. And so uh, with what, what we've uh, realized is that uh, without addressing these two issues of the age of the farms and the disease, the production will go down. So. We decided to face up to this issue, and what I wanted to uh, underscore is that the initiative is good. We had to renew the whole farms. Uh, the producer only sees the advantage, but they do not feel concerned in the first place. So when uh, we talk to them, if they have about six hectares, uh, you will see that only two hectares are, uh, uh, have a swollen shoot. Uh, but with the uh, capacity building we are working on, we need to uh, cut down all this uh, uh, area. Uh, but the farmer will say, no, I have a few trees that are still producing. But what we've done at the level of the cooperative is that uh, we work with the producer over two years. So we... Uh, uh, wait until the, uh, the we help him until the farm starts uh, producing again, uh, and the new variety of plants we have can produce within eight, eight, eighteen months. But in the meantime, what is the producer going to eat? So the cooperative steps in to help, uh, perhaps uh, seeds, uh, or, or perhaps a bag of rice. Uh, so that uh, the pro producer can wait for around two years until the new farm starts producing again. So these are the steps that uh, we've taken in order to attract the producers and uh, uh, keep them with us. And next to this issue uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, mentioned, that is the swollen shoot. Uh, we also have the issue of having access to financing. When you are a producer, it is not easy to get credit. Yet, uh, when you are a farmer, uh, it's a job like any other job. And uh, when uh, you go and apply for a loan, uh, it's uh, very difficult. No one wants to give you a loan. And I try to study this issue, uh, wondering why uh, uh, farmers uh, could not get loans. And my research has shown that there is a problem of uh, management uh, when it comes uh, to cooperatives. Uh, cooperatives uh, are not, uh, do not have a bank account, and that's a real concern. So uh, we have to allow the producers to have a relationship with the bank, and when we sell the cocoa today, the producer wants the money right away. But if we had taken time to explain to the producer that it is better to put this money into a bank account uh, and uh, talk to them about uh, saving and uh, uh, encourage the producer to go to the bank, uh, the problem would be better resolved. 
And so at our level, as a manager of these cooperatives, we not only uh, get the cooperative to work with the banks uh, and allow all the operations of the purchase or uh, sale uh, to be done through the bank. And then uh, when people wanted to take loans, the bank will not hesitate. So this is the study I carried out in my region, and we found out that there were no banks. And so there was another problem. If we don't have banks, how can we take the producer to the bank? But then I noted that each producer had a mobile phone in all the villages, uh, they have the mobile network, and so with the help of one of our partners, uh, we approached a, a te telephone company, and we said uh, there are payments that are made, uh, the producers uh, can deposit money on their accounts, um, uh, why not introduce this in the cocoa farming, and the uh, telephone company agreed to help us, and today when cocoa is sold, uh, it is not accepted that you deposit all the money on the account. If it is 1,000, at least 200 will go on the account, and the other 800 will be used for the needs of the farmer. And so these 200 are a savings. And uh, with that savings, uh, the telephone company is in contact with banks and uh, with uh, phytosanitary uh, uh, company, uh, with companies selling phytosanitary products. And so the, that uh, solution, once uh, the producer has this savings, it is up to him or her to decide what they want to do with these savings uh, to buy entrance inputs uh, to, uh, for their farm. And we have explained to the telephone company that we have a small project. And generally speaking, uh, as soon as the uh, campaign is over, the producers have uh, uh, issues with money, and they cannot pay for all the expenses. And so we've told them that uh, since uh, it's uh, six months before they can have money, uh, you have to allow them to use the money they saved. And this is how we can help them uh, so that uh, they can have inputs. But uh, the huge issue we've got is that we need to help our producers. We have to help them. We have to teach them. Uh, we have to re-educate them. Uh, because they were used to a certain system, and this system has to be upgraded, uh, but uh, it is uh, the input of the cooperative and the initiatives uh, such as the Cocoa Plan of Nestle that will help us achieve our goal. There are so many things I would like to say, but I will stop here for now. I happen to know that there are some people from Fair Trade in the room, and I hope they were taking notes because if you ever wanted a first hand case study in how to set up, run, and develop a cooperative, well, you know what? We've just heard it. That was absolutely superb. Thank you so much. So, from Sophie, um, we've we, we've, we've, we've started global, we've come into Pan-Africa, we've come into Cote d'Ivoire, and we've dug down locally. Now, Will, you're going to take us back out again. Um, you, you, we've heard already some, some good examples of, of what can be done to improve farmer resilience. You've been working in this space for quite some time. So how do we speed up progress? What's in the way of taking some of the things that we've heard about today and, and really accelerating progress so that we're not having this conversation in another five years' time or six? Well, thanks for that really, thanks for that really simple question, Ron. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got some ideas uh, about how I think we can accelerate this. Um, and uh, normally, I'm, I'm always encouraging people 
to make sure and listen to the voice of the farmer. And I want to compliment the organizers here. We've heard the farmer in the video before our session. We've heard farmer voices on the panel itself. Uh, TechnoServe, the organization I lead, was founded 50 years ago to help provide business solutions to poverty. And we're privileged to work with hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers directly across Africa and across the world. And we are constantly struck by the complex nature of the challenges and the risks that these smallholders have to manage. And the very complex set of calculations that they have to go through to figure out where to allocate their time and money. So even if an organization spent decades directly engaged with the smallholder, I think we're constantly learning from them, reminded of that, and reminded of the, uh, the, the, the not falling prey to cookie-cutter solutions, that what might be right for a farmer in this district may be quite different from uh, one uh, quite nearby. Uh, I, I think, though, that in terms of uh, how we uh, speed up this progress on, uh, on uh, smallholder resilience, uh, I think that the great uh, – I think we live in an exciting moment, and I think that there is a great opportunity to accelerate these sorts of shared value um, initiatives. And it, it is always a three-legged stool, in my view. I think that um, for business, while Nestle was quite early to this space and has been a leader for some time, I think that the rest of the business community is catching up. And I think attitudes are fundamentally changing uh, among business and business that, that are active in emerging markets, uh, which is enormously encouraging because, of course, that's where the money is. Uh, for every dollar of foreign aid, there are, depending on whose numbers you use, five to seven dollars of direct investment. And mm -hmm. I believe it was either last year or the year before, where even on the continent of Africa, there were more investment dollars than aid dollars. Right. Uh, business is taking a long view. We've been reminded that Nestle has been active uh, on the continent for 100 years. Uh, so governments come and go, uh, NGOs come and go, but business, uh, I think, is engaged for the, the long term. And just to give you a sense of what is possible uh, with the engagement of business and shared value thinking, um, I, I just want to tell you a very quick story from what I think is the absolute front lines of shared value. And that is uh, in South Sudan. You saw the uh, honey project there earlier. Uh, Nestle challenged us to think with them uh, beginning in 2011 about whether uh, there is some extraordinary and very rare coffee in the southern part of South Sudan. And could this become a, an opportunity which, in a great shared value sense, is both commercially viable and interesting for the company and an economic engine and, and a force for development for the community? And uh, fast forward a few years with the work with groups of farmers there, I had the privilege to visit South Sudan a few months ago and to walk uh, uh, around on one of these coffee farms. This is a, an area in the southern part of the country which has been politically relatively stable. Uh, farming families there are food secure. And so I walked with the farmer Isaya, who grows five or six food crops uh, and also grows coffee. And he was proudly showing me his coffee trees, proudly talking about his improved practices, and talking about how things have changed for his family. His kids are in school. Uh, he has some savings for the first time, uh, medicine if the baby gets sick. Uh, but what was truly inspiring to me is the connection he made, not just to, the, to his family and not just to his community, but indeed to his whole country. Uh, I've never been with farmers where they connected what they were doing on that farm, and I think it's the world's youngest nation. People have been very involved in that, and so they think about uh, how it can impact the entire country. Uh, we're certainly convinced that if there can be continued political stability, uh, coffee could become the second largest export for the country of South Sudan. So it, it really is already transformational in certain communities and I think has the potential to scale greatly. It is really on the cutting edge of shared value the business opportunity and the social opportunity, the win-win that everybody's been talking about. So I, I think that business is poised to do more in the space. I think that uh, obviously governments need to be engaged and need to provide a stable and enabling environment. And uh, I think while we're sitting here in the midst of a really sterling example of very uh, proactive and good policy, uh, 
was fascinating to hear the Prime Minister's remarks this morning and how thoughtful and deliberate the government here is being about the sort of policies which can bring business in, make it a good environment to do business in, and at the same time can, can maximize the revenue um, for the government. Uh, I, I think that uh, governments need to be mindful that uh, everyone in a market system likes some predictability. Uh, there's another country, West Africa, who I believe in the space of one year went from providing fertilizer, a very heavy subsidy, to there being no subsidy at all, to declaring that all fertilizer would be provided free of charge by the government. And those sorts of wild policy swings uh, really don't help anyone. They don't help the agro-dealers who are so important to get the inputs to farmers. Farmers don't know what to make of it either. Um, so uh, I think that um, governments are, uh, are key. Uh, and, and lastly, of course, civil society. Um, and I would include groups like mine. That, um, I think of us as sort of an intermediary organization, an organization that's able to uh, to a certain extent translate, speak the language of business and translate between government and business uh, and also help uh, with on the ground implementation. Uh, so there, it's challenging because these sorts of multi-stakeholder partnerships where you have business taking part, government taking part and civil society taking part are complicated. Um, there are some great examples, particularly here, Masanje knows the, the work much better than I do, uh, but there are some great examples of those happening and I think that's the opportunity, the shared value opportunity, which can really speed up uh, the process. Yeah, excellent. Thank, thanks, Will. Um, I said to the panelists earlier on, if we see the same question coming up on Twitter, it's the equivalent of being shouted at. And I, I have to tell you, you, I'm not sure you can see this, but we're being shouted at. And we're being shouted at about the issue of GMOs and the extent to which, I guess, behind the question, whether GMOs could be, in some way or other, supportive of enhancing farmer resilience. And I'm thinking that, Bob, you might be the best person to pick up on that and see if you've got a reflection from your perspective. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I, when we, the debate over GMOs is very polarized, or polarizing, uh, and not least because there are two issues that get completely confused together. On the one hand, you have the research tool of genetic engineering, which every National Academy of Science in the world, even the European Food Safety Agency, says is neither safer nor less safe than classical plant breeding for human health and the environment. On the other hand, you have the issue of who does it. Is it public sector? Is it the private sector? Are the resulting technologies patented? And the tools of biotechnology matured in the 1970s at the very time the public support for agriculture research was being cut. It was being cut in direct appropriations like the U.S. Congress, many parliaments in Europe. It was also being cut in our foreign aid programs, the fraction of our foreign aid that was going to uh, agriculture development. But these tools of genetic engineering were maturing, and the private sector took them in both human health and agriculture and, uh, and applied them to develop some technologies to, that uh, could increase the profitability of farmers using those technologies. They're patented because they're private, publicly traded private sector companies. They cannot, uh, the research model doesn't work unless they can generate revenue to pay for the cost of their research. So. There's nothing about genetic engineering that says it can only be done in the private sector. It's just that the resources haven't been there for the, pu private, for the public sector uh, to apply it. Why is this important? Particularly in the context of climate change. I think that the tools of genetic, genetic engineering are the most powerful tools that we have in our biological research toolkit to introduce greater resilience into, uh, into the crops. Resilience in the face of droughts, resilience in the face of extreme, climatic extremes of, of, any, of any type. Uh, but uh, we desperately need a recommitment of public resources to complement those in the private sector uh, because the private sector is going to solve, try to solve the most economically costly problems of the most economically important crops of the rich countries. But this leaves a lot of problem, or a lot that need a lot of issues that need research in low-income countries, uh, where we really need uh, a recommitment of public resources, sometimes through public-private partnerships. Mm. Uh, but the t don't throw away the most powerful research tool we have in our toolkit, just because you don't like who's applying it. Yeah. 
Excellent. That's a helpful insight into the need. And I think what you're hinting at, if I may, is the need for accountability and some sense of who owns it, who owns this technology and, uh, and, and, and what they're going to do with it. Yeah, we often forget that in the agriculture development of Western Europe, North America, Japan, we basically used an open software model of agriculture technology development, yeah. created with public support uh, and made freely available to all comers. In fact, we even created an extension service to push it out into farmer applications. Mm. So uh, that's, there's no more reason for us to expect low-income farmers in low-income countries today to be able to afford to pay for the research that raises their uh, earning potential than it was 100 years ago in the US. So we really need the public sector to come back in this good. area. OK, that's helpful. Right, good. We're going to open up a little bit. Um, I think what we'll do is just see if anybody has a comment or question before we go to uh, a couple of respondents who I know have uh, got something prepared. So bearing in mind what you've heard, we've come to breadth of things. We have a comment or question at the back there. So hopefully we've got a microphone that's winging its way towards you. We have two there, one there, one there. And when your microphone arrives, as surely it will in momentarily, if you could say your name and your organization and then make your point as quickly as you can. Do we have some microphones there? We've got another one here. Here they come. So if you could put your hand up. Yep. Uh, the gentleman here, it, right here, no, to this side first. Can we have a microphone here? Yep, well done. Thank you. And then we're coming to you, sir. So you, sir, with your hand up, and then you, sir, immediately afterwards. So your name, your organization, and a brief comment or question would be great. Thank you. Eric Tavares, Ubuntu Capital. Um, just a few quick comments and a question. First, for the lady from the cooperatives, you have people coming into the market that are, je vous, en, en français, ce sera peut-être plus simple. Vous avez des, aujourd'hui, de plus en plus... Uh, there are more and more initiatives today covering cooperatives coming to you. That is, you have efforts to make in terms of governance. But very clearly, today, there are people who understand that interest is in... Uh, going down the chain to actually get value. And there are initiatives being put in place for you. So make all the efforts to be sexy enough to attract such initiatives. But uh, don't worry, you will quite quickly be able to find people to talk with. And I invite you to Take some time to discuss. I'll leave my business card with you. For our dear Mrs. Touré, I would like to have further information regarding the private-public partnership you alluded to. Thank you. Give a quick reflection, if you want to make a reflection on that, Ms. Sanjay. Merci beaucoup. Donc, euh, concernant les partenariats publics privés, nous avons le partenariat avec, euh, les, les, pardon, avec euh, Cargill, Cargill dans le domaine de construction d'écoles. Nous of, avons uh, building of schools and capacity building of cooperatives, a partnership with uh, not only Cargill but Ayafil. Uh, because the cooperatives need to be upgraded. We have a partnership with Anader. We have partnerships with Mondelex. I think that everybody knows this company in the area of the fight against the swollen shoot. And other partnerships we've got are partnerships with universities, the University of Boisquet, for instance. We have various partnerships. Uh, I can't list them all uh, from the top of my head, but we also have a partnership with the Web Cocoa Foundation uh, to improve productivity, but also for the training of producers. So we have several partnerships. 
and I invite you to go on uh, our website and you will see the various types of uh, partnerships that uh, we've got with various organizations. Excellent, thank you. Now before we take more questions, we're going to come to our front row discussants. Uh, we'll start with Adama Ekber Koulibaly, who is from the UN Commission for Africa uh, in Addis Ababa, um, so has an Ethiopian perspective. So if we could have a microphone to the front here, please, that would be great. Are we ready? Keep coming down and I'll tell you when... Uh, yes, here we are, just right here. And let's get a perspective from another part of Africa, from the Ethiopian uh, side of things. Adama, over to you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm here as a Adama Ekbe Kulibadi, Chief of uh, Agriculture, Food Security and Land for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa based in Addis Ababa. As you know, the, the ECA has been since 1958 the mother think tank for the continent, setting not only the agenda but also the strategic direction for the continent. To come back quickly to um, the element that uh, bringing us today, I would say that first, resilience is about an overarching theme that touching both on eradication poverty, food security, and nutrition. We have to take this concept, but not stay at the abstract level. To, to, it's a pertinent concept to make it more practical, especially for the farmers. I will say here, we have to take a system thinking approach, linking here, or taking even a resilience lens view. As you have seen from the intervention of the different speakers, it touched on many areas, it touched on many sectors, it touched also on many levels. But the most important concept here is how to build capacity, how to make sure that the farmers bounce back to all kinds of shocks that can, that can come whether it be it a climate, private uh, price shocks, disease, and so on. That is why it will take really a holistic response. This is what is bringing us back to the theme also of this conference, sustainability, mm -hmm. the SDGs. This is about making sure that we don't leave anybody behind. This is what is important. When you have a system, at the core of the system is people. And what is at the core here is the farmer. If a farmer doesn't bounce back, it means that the whole system will collapse. So beyond bouncing back to the state where the farmers were, uh, can be before the shocks, we have also to link to this concept of resilience, the anticipation. So it's the ability to not only bounce back, but the ability to anticipate shocks that will come. So I would like to see here that most of the uh, inter, uh, speakers have touched on different areas, but it's important that we see, I would say for, especially for Nestle, Nestle is, has been a great company demonstrating that in, uh, in the world, also in Africa, that we can create value. There's no, no, uh, uh, no place more than Africa where we need more to create this wealth. But we need to add also to this concept of creation of wealth, how to retain wealth in Africa. So we need to create value, but we need to make sure that this value is retained in Africa. This is what the SDG is about, to make sure that it's people-centered, but to make sure that the complicity that we have, that all the issues are linked to one another. So this is uh, what I would like to say before uh, uh, certainly adding a few uh, points to the different speakers. I will say that, yes, the, regarding the concept, the concept has to be more comprehensive uh, 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 than uh, when we are looking at this global aspect of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the resilience. It touched not only climate price, but it's important that we make sure that the concept of resilience is operationalized at the field level. 
So we would like here to underscore what Peter and Paul, uh, Paul said in their intervention earlier. This is the first time where private sector is involved on this global agenda. Call has been made to make sure that government countries contribute at least 0.7% of their GDP. Call has been also made to make sure that government in Africa contribute 10% of their national budget. It's important to take opportunity of this agenda now that private sector has been associated to the global agenda to make a call also to the global corporate world. And Nestle being the leader of this corporate world, we have shown that, we have seen that Nestle can lead by example. So this is where the opportunity is. It's a big burden to really mobilize resource for the farmers to make sure that they became residents, providing concrete program. The call that ECA would like to make here is to make sure that the corporate world also respond to this unique opportunity to also contribute to this effort. Certainly, I would say at minimum, contributing a 1% of the turnover to uh, uh, at least uh, put in place some resource that can accompany the effort of government, accompany the effort of, uh, uh, I would say, farmers themselves. But this is a great call. This is a great opportunity. And we believe that at ECA, that Nestle can respond to that challenge mm -hmm. by leading by, uh, by example. Thank you. Thank you, Adama. That was great. And one thing I should say, uh, by the way, is that as you were speaking, uh, you now hold a record which it's just come through that we've got more viewers looking at this conference around the world, 5,000 people, than there's ever been before. So I think you now have the record of being, speaking to the most number of people that anybody has done at a CSV conference. Congratulations. Uh, Frederick, next to you. Let's, let's hear from you next. Frederick Schroers, who's the uh, chief executive of the business incubation platform of the IITA, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture. Uh, the microphone was there, and I think we've lost it. If we can get it back down here, that would be great. Yep, down here, please. Thanks, Frederick. Over to you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to um, strengthen a few points which brought up by the panel. And the first one is, uh, I think that there's a very good remark, Africa should and could feed itself. And the other one is, yes, we need to look more at community level. How can we achieve that going to the grassroots? Um, in this whole, more or less, holistic approach, in the way I see it is, we should not forget the youth. Youth is so important. 60% of the unemployment in Africa is under the 30 to 35. Depends how you classify youth. That's a little debatable. You cannot send in the youth into the field, have a cutlass and a hoe, and say, listen, let's go farming and make some business. That's... <clears throat> <clears throat> There's absolutely not of this time anymore. So what we try to do at the IATA, and Nestle is also very much supportive in this, we try to create, uh, with new technologies, bring uh, young people into an, what I call agripreneurial stage. They learn how to do with new farming activities, set up the business, and not a business just come off the poverty level now, create a sustainable business. How to get a family? What is a family? What is a household? And what? Why would they go to the city? Because that's another point which I like to bring in this holistic question or approach. What triggers young people to go to the city? I think we had a point, well, it's interesting. There are things which are not in the village. There's school, there's education, there's entertainment. Uh, and it's maybe not cool. We heard that word today earlier. Linking into this, if we create young people and Nestle does it in a certain way, in certain programs, and we work with them on this. Coco comes very soon in my, uh, my keep it short, in this, my, 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 um, my presentation, is that we must create example figures who are in the city, who were in the city, who had a degree, who want to do something. Get them back to the villages, get them back with the right technology. They should ask, they should act as role models, and then others should follow. They should become cool. They should say, hey, we should go there. An interesting example where you can do that and cross borders is the good example of what Coco is, uh, has done with Nestle in, uh, in, um, in uh, Ivory Coast. 
Soon we'll start a cooperation that uh, the technology like is used here in Ivory Coast will be probably implemented also with private partners. Nestle brings the technology. Ola might do the distribution. IITA will train the youth. Does all this chocolate go to Nestle? No. It will help people in Africa, in Nigeria, to set up their own businesses, to make sure they do it in a sustainable way. The other examples I can bring up where Nestle played an important role, we spoke a few times about stunted growth. Aflatoxins are very important in stunted growth. Mm. IATA has pro developed a product against aflatoxin. That's now widely distributed over Africa. Problem, technically very good product. Economically, yeah, I can bring percentages. Yes, it gives 100% return, but it is $18 per hectare you have to invest. 36 you get back. Now comes what I think is a corporate responsibility for a government. They should subsidize to a certain extent, like you do with chlorination of water. It's a public good. Well, there you get everything together, bring it in one, one, one way called one big bowl, get the private uh, enterprises, get the government. Uh, today, I think the Minister of Cote d'Ivoire, he mentioned a very important point, tax benefits. Why are, I've, heard, I've not heard any African country is doing it, but maybe I'm wrong, is that young entrepreneurs, maybe up to the age of 33, should not pay tax or should get a tax benefit. That stimulates young people to do that. That brings them back into the village and that makes them cool. So I will stop now. I think the one clear part is that if we don't build in youth in our plans, there's no, there is no sustainable future. Frederick, thank you. Uh, interestingly enough, there's been um, another uh, question coming up on Twitter that's been pretty consistent around enticing youth back. And you just made a call for tax treatment that could perhaps help. And I just wonder if, uh, Masanja, you'd like to respond to that comment. Oui, j'ai vu la question qui demandait à savoir... Uh, getting to know about the youth employment program of Côte d'Ivoire. The first thing that we ask for is that there be no land dispute around the piece of land that the youth wants to use. Once the village community has recognized that the youth is the owner of the piece of land, uh, the minimum being three hectares, our coffee and cocoa board will provide improved cocoa seeds that we call the Mercedes cocoa here in Cote d'Ivoire, and also coffee seeds. But we ask those youths to reserve a portion of a piece of land to grow vegetables or do poultry farming. And it's also necessary to train those youths. So they're trained and uh, followed up until uh, the, the farm yields. We started only last year. So the plan is to create uh, processing units in country so we can produce chocolate or cocoa based products finished products because and the prime minister alluded to that in the morning it seems to us that uh, there's a lack of interest in processing through to the finished product. I've seen a lady who was startled at uh, me saying this. She's the only one actually doing this uh, currently in Cote d'Ivoire. We have a sub-regional market of 100 million uh, consumers in the UMWA or YMO region and 300 million in the ECOWAS region. So we want to set up uh, small processing units to add value within the country. 
That's excellent because, again, you've, you've taken some of the themes that we heard about earlier on and you've made them really practical and we've brought them to life. We've got a little bit of time left, not much, but I'd really like to open up to the room. We had a, I don't know if the gentleman at the back, we've got one here. AJ, we'll go here. If we've got a microphone, uh, gosh, we've got a forest of hands. So let's have a microphone down at the front here, if I could, please. Ready with a microphone here, if someone's coming this way. And then we'll take two or three more and see if we can get some, uh, some answers from the panel before we wrap up. Thank you. I'm uh, Jay Vashi, past president of IFEP. Um, I think one of the biggest uh, hindrances to the resilience of small-scale farmers is the lack of access to risk management instruments, um, mm -hmm. both for crop failure or price, uh, price fluctuations. Um, there's an inherent belief that the market me mechanism will, will do this, but you'll find generally it's unaffordable to a lot of farmers. Um, this also prevents a lot of small-scale farmers from adopting new technologies because there's a, there's a fear of adopting something, and then if it doesn't come through, then um, you're, you basically lost your livelihood. So is it correct, in your opinion, anybody on the panel, for governments to take a back seat and not to make any intervention to improve uh, the resilience of farmers by maybe underwriting the risk as, as a strategic intervention? Will, I'd like you to see if you could pick up on that, if you would, please. Yeah, well, I think uh, I would probably answer yes to your question. I that the uh, need for risk management tools, I completely agree with you. I do think it's encouraging that they are spreading, and Sophie spoke about her uh, cooperative's experience with the mobile phone, and I think the spread of mobile money is one of the ways that more and more smallholders will, uh, over time, access this sort of insurance. Uh, but uh, in general, philosophically, uh, Technos would come from the point of view that uh, rather than having government provide that, let's see if there isn't a viable market solution. And we're seeing more and more of that already. Okay, thank you. Uh, two more questions. So there's a gentleman there with a shirt. Um, if we could have a microphone here, please. And anybody else? Well, we've got a whole cluster over there. So the man who's waving, he's making the most effort, so he gets the microphone. There you go. It's as simple as that. Uh, the man that's waving. Yeah, there you go. If you put that much effort into it, you get a question. Uh, to you, sir, first. All right. Good evening. My name is Shago Michael from Nigeria. Please, I would like to implore, uh, as in, I would like to solicit for your support for Nigerian farmers. Because due to the dwindling price in oil, global market, the government of Nigeria is now trying to go into agriculture because agriculture is like the new good mine in Nigeria. Please, I would like to solicit for your support for peasant farmers, as in for access to loans or okay. fertilizers as yeah. implements that would boost agriculture in Nigeria. Okay, so, f so financing so uh, farm improvements, great. And uh, the gentleman there, please. All right. Uh, my name is Shea Abolaji from Nigeria, representing Wilson's Juice Company. Um, a, a comment that was made a little earlier, I think, is very important uh, representing some of the youths here is um, one success stories um, we think about technology and such and it's very popular because you hear many success stories whether it's investments or buyouts or whatever I think that's one second is this issue about tax um, <laughs> almost the other way that you were just saying that uh, solic soliciting uh, support you know in Nigeria as a young entrepreneur is almost like your targets for tax people so I think this is um, creative, innovative, and very inexpensive ways, actually, to, to support young entrepreneurs and to make anything agro-processing, agro-business uh, attractive to youths. So thank you for the comments made. And uh, anybody here from Nigeria, um, please, let's listen and do something about that. Well, we heard earlier on from Ruth about uh, interconnections, so there's the Nigerian voice. Okay, so you get, you get the, you get, you, yes, the gentleman with his hand up, and then we have to start to conclude on the panel. So your last point, please. Je suis Dr. du laboratoire de recherche The research center of the um, 
National Teachers Training School of Abidjan. My question is to Madame Toure. We know that uh, her organization does a lot of social work and school has now been made uh, obligatory, compulsory here in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, I'm a president of an NO, uh, NGO for the promotion of preschooling in Cote d'Ivoire. And we have often not been satisfied because uh, the system only uh, will apply compulsory school to uh, children from year six, uh, from uh, age six. Uh, so I would like to plead for children below the age of six. Uh, I can say that I will contact you to see what can be done, and that will be with great pleasure. Now we're going to close. Um, I'd like to give you each a word to finish up with, if we could make it really short. And we're going to ask for maybe a, a reflection, an action, maybe a recommendation for Nestle from what you've heard. Mandy, we'll start with you and we'll work our way back this way. So, Thanks, uh, Rob. Yeah. Uh, recommendation for Nestle. I think that um, Nestle needs to establish a social venture fund. I think this uh, forum creating a, a, a common value is, is a great idea, but I think there is still much emphasis on business entrepreneurship and not enough emphasis on social entrepreneurship because I think that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to g g uh, link business entrepreneurship to social entrepreneurship. So even some of the winners, so some of the categories should be those who, who have come up with uh, or a social venture fund which funds so, um, uh, social entrepreneurship which pays for business. Se uh, secondly, uh, for governments, I think governments supported by big business should assist in creating community foundations and community trusts which allow social cohesion in communities and allow them to deal better with the government's NGOs and businesses. So and finally, my recommendation to uh, Fred. Fred the Great, uh, I think the University of Leadership should have curriculum on nexus between social and business entrepreneurship. So the connection there. And finally, research, PhD research on leadership as an independent variable explaining social and business entrepreneurship. Thank you. He's breathing down our necks, so we're going to be really okay. quick, Bob. My actionable recommendation is for governments of Africa that if uh, my sense is that one of the greatest barriers to su success in agriculture development and rural poverty alleviation is the historical underinvestment in rural roads. Uh, the associated high cost of transportation makes it unprofitable often to adopt even the already available improved technologies. Uh, the private sector has a critical role to play, but if they don't have the enabling environment of which roads are an important component, uh, it doesn't happen. Brilliant. Sophie, one word? Okay. One word. D'accord. Okay, je serai pas assez long. Just uh, like to encourage Nestle for all the uh, measures and actions uh, it's an undertaking for our producers. Uh, we want to encourage them and uh, suggestion. We would like uh, Nestle to create a platform of exchange between our cooperatives and all those uh, who can help us, uh, who can accompany us uh, in terms of training, and perhaps a platform where people can help the producers uh, when it comes uh, to insurance, uh, health insurance. Uh, these are issues that plague us all the time. We make an effort, but uh, it would be good if we could have some exchange between us and people who could uh, advise us in those areas. What a great suggestion. Thank you, Masanja. Your brief word. Merci. Moi, je voudrais simplement. Uh... I'd like to say to Nestle to keep up the excellent work. I would like to say that this concept that we're sharing, because it is also our vision.
to uh, try to improve the uh, living conditions of producers, we believe that through the platform, uh, the PPP platform, which has been put together by the Coffee Cocoa Board uh, and the civil society, the, the industry, and technical and financial partners, we believe that this platform uh, deserves to be a little more dynamic, thanks to the, the involvement of everybody, so that uh, we can see how to make the profession of a cocoa and coffee farmer uh, an attractive uh, profession for the youth and for women, to make them uh, a key element of the chain. That's the message I wanted to pass on. And what's already working? Will, final word to you. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, I think my encouragement to Nestle would be to uh, think if there are uh, additional opportunities to leverage your 300,000 plus workforce that you've got to work for us with a range of skills, food processing, business supply chain. I think there is a real leverage point with uh, the uh, thousands of small food processors across Africa. And as they uh, do better, the availability of uh, more nutrient rich foods expands. And so that nexus that we were talking about earlier between nutrition and agriculture, I think, could be advanced. And then, of course, the workforce increasingly wants this, these sorts of opportunities and meaning uh, as a part of their career at a company like this. Thank you. Great direct advice to the company. Uh, please join me in thanking what I think is possibly the best panel I've ever had, to w had the opportunity to work with, of, of a blend of just wonderful skills and experiences. And I hope you uh, enjoyed their conversation. Really good. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Hello. Thank you, Rob, for your fantastic job in facilitating that panel. And thank you again to all the panelists.